I once got into some hot water with some folks at a Bible study because, well, I wouldn't agree that people can ignore teachings in the Bible and still be enough of a good person to get into heaven. I was asked questions like, doesn't God want us to be good people? Doesn't being a good person matter to God? So surely a loving God won't turn a good person away from heaven, right? I was even called a very callous and judgmental individual, and this by those who were also claiming to be fellow Christians, fellow believers in Christ. So let's talk about it. What's the deal with God and good people? Welcome to a simple, not shallow video a video meant to help you steep in God's love. Well, much like coffee steeps in a good French press until your faith is just like that very good cup of coffee. Simple, but strong, full of flavor and richly satisfying. So let the steeping begin. Now, first, I, I, I think I would really like to share with you why I think this is so important to talk about and, and to find an answer to. See, this has nothing to do with being right. It has nothing to do with being uh, religiously correct. Well, it has nothing to do with being religious at all, for that matter. It is about loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. For if we don't know the answer to this, well, how can we then ever inspire others to discover and to live their best life ever? See, I simply know and I care about too many good people not to want to inspire them to greatness. Don't you? I mean, well, if being a good person is all that matters, is all that it takes, then excellent! Nothing else needs to be considered, and they quite honestly may be living their best life. But if it isn't, and they aren't, then how is it loving to not learn and embrace the answer that best equips us to inspire them to greatness, to inspire them to discover it? It isn't loving, is it? Oh, you know, true, we may feel better about not doing so. I mean, about not being inconvenienced, about having to be honest about it. About being made uncomfortable by sharing things that no one else wants to hear. But true love accepts being made inconvenienced short-term for the long-term well-being of the ones that are loved. See, knowing and sharing the truth is the loving thing to do. That is why this is so important. Now, yes, this has to be done in a very loving manner, but that is a topic all of its own, and one we'll save for a different day. But for now, let's move on to the deal. What's the deal with God and good people? How does God deal with good people? And just as importantly, how do we even know who God considers to be a good person? I mean, you know who you consider to be a good person, and I know who I consider to be a good person. Yet here's the rub in all that. What happens when the person you think of as a very good person is also thought of by somebody else as a bad person? It happens all the time. I mean, in American politics, for example, we see this all the time. There's one person who's considered to be very, very good and at the same time considered to be the embodiment of evil, completely depending upon who you ask. Now, this person is considered quite honestly by both people to be who they are. One person honestly considers them to be good. One person honestly considers them to be bad. He is honestly considered both. And yet he honestly cannot be both. Who is right? Who should God align himself with in considering whether this person is good or not? 
Well, let's leave politics behind. Let's get a little more personal, shall we? See, one of the hardest lessons I have ever learned is that no matter what I do, no matter how good I am, no matter how kind I am, no matter how considerate of other people, of other people I try to be, someone, somewhere, is going to hate me. It's, it's just a sad fact of life. So that while many people, myself included, think that I'm a, a fairly good person, there are indeed those who think that I am not. So here's the question. Will God consider me a bad person simply because somebody else thinks I am? So that no matter what other people think, because one person thinks I'm bad, I'm a bad person? You know, is, is God determining, determining who's good and bad really dependent upon who he asks? Is there nothing more profound than human opinion to which he appeals to? Now, here's another thing, something that might make your head spin. Since we cannot always agree as human beings on who is a good person and a bad person, how can we honestly say that we have a certainty of who is truly good and truly bad? I mean, we know who we think it is, but this person claims they're bad. How do we truly know? And because of this, how can we proof positive know who God considers to be a good person. Now, you may say, yes, but God knows the truth. He knows the human heart. He knows who the good people are and who the good people are not. He knows the truth. And you know, I think you're right. I think God does know the truth. God. He is the other half of this whole equation, is he not? Well, does he give us any clues as to who he considers to be a good person? Is there any indication that he gives us that might help us in deciding who he considers to be a truly good person, good enough for him to welcome home unreservedly? Well, I think he does. Well, the first clue that I have found is that he loves us all, every single one on the planet. He loves us all equally. He loves us all well. He plays no favorites. He's the great leveler of the playing field, you might say. Everybody is treated and seen in the exact same way. So either he considers us all to be very good people, or none of us are. There are no favorites. There are no exceptions, which is a good thing. Now, the next clue that I have found is that Jesus says he had to come, die, and rise again to make it possible for anybody to come back to him, to be welcomed back by God. So, I don't think he considers to any of us to be very good people. I mean, he had to come for everybody, all of us, equally and alike, for we all, equally and alike, betrayed his love. See, we cheated on him with ourselves. He gave us his love, and we said, yeah, no, not so much. Thanks anyway, but I'm going to look after myself. Yes, I'm going to take care of myself. Thank you very much. And that's just what we did. We cheated on his love with our feelings of of self-importance, of self-control, you know, controlling our own destiny, being in control of who we are and what we're going to do. In short, we cheated with feelings of self-infatuation. Now, I have had my trust betrayed, haven't you? And while I have forgiven them, I do not consider them to be truly good people. You do understand what I'm saying, right? Then why should it surprise us that God does not consider those who have betrayed his love to be good people as either, you know? The next clue comes when he tells us over and over and over again exactly what it takes to be welcomed home by him. And when he tells us that we have nothing to sweat about it as far as being good enough 
because we can't be good enough. See, there's nothing good enough that we can do to ever earn this welcome or to make him like us any more than he already does. He already loves us, which is why he's done any of this in the first place. And he simply says, let go of yourselves. Come and embrace me. Which is to say, to accept his invitation through faith in Jesus alone. And this is very, very good. Because, you know, he's done all the heavy lifting. He's done everything required. All we have to do is say, yes, please. So, I find myself having to agree with the Apostle Paul. Who is, when he says that there are no grounds on which we can ever say that we are good enough for God or to ever have God consider us good enough to be welcomed home, well, apart from accepting the offer of Jesus. So, back to the question. The one that started this all, what's the deal with God and good people? Well, it seems that when we betrayed his love, we ceased from ever being good people. God does not consider us good enough. With God, good people then, isn't even a thing. There are none who are good. Well, until next time, love simply, love wisely, and love well, and care enough about the good people you know to share with them the way to discover their best life ever. Back to our coffee metaphor. Learn this and care enough about them to share it that you may introduce them to the French press way of life, which is the abundant life Jesus came to give. Lead them away, inspire them away from that instant coffee way of life. See, instant coffee? Well, that's coffee that's never quite coffee enough. And friends, never encourage friends to drink instant coffee. That is not caring, nor is it compassionate. Indeed, that is downright hateful. <laughs> Tell me what you think in the comments below. And click that like and subscribe button and that gray notification bell. And next time, we'll bring a friend for good coffee and good conversation loves good company. Now, also, the Bible verses that I've referenced in this video, I will post those in the description box below for anybody who's interested. And thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Talk to you soon.